All right, good morning, my friends. Let's uh, flip over to Galatians chapter 5. <clears throat> We're going to finish off the fruit of the Spirit. We're going to, we've kind of been focusing in on the first three portions, the, uh, the love and the joy and the peace, and really want to focus in on those as um, kind of uh, internal truths, uh, internal realities that God's wanting to form in us, and not to lose sight or to, um, to, to talk about and embrace the idea that these are things that are formed in us, right? That it's the fruit of the Spirit. It's not the fruit of trying hard. It's not the, uh, the fruit of being a better person. It's not something that we create out of ourselves. It's something that God does in us. So since we've kind of focused in on those, I want to kind of uh, back the lens off a little bit and go back to and read a little bit more this week so we can uh, kind of reiterate the context and, and then look at these last portions of it uh, and how they work out in our lives. So in Galatians chapter 5 and in verse 16, we're going to start here. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. Hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, and let, us keep, uh, excuse me, and let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Now, this is, as we've said before, but by brief review, this is uh, the beginning, or part of the beginning of Paul's practical application to the whole book of or the letter uh, to Galatia, or the churches in Galatia, right? So, Paul has laid out in, in this letter and, and many other letters that a person is not made right with God through their works. Now, this might seem repetitive to you, and I'm not trying to be repetitive, but I think that there is, uh, well, I think based on the fact that Paul, in almost every one of his letters, writes about it, uh, that uh, Peter writes about it, over and over again, this idea of being justified or being made righteous with God by, uh, through grace, or by grace through faith is, is all over the New Testament. And, and, and realistically, I think there's a part for many of us, if not all of us, that, that a little bit wants to creep in somehow that, no, I'm not made right with God just by faith. It, it cannot be that I just trust God and, for, for what Jesus did, and that makes me right with him. And I think even culturally, uh, you know, we live in a, a, a meritous culture, right? So everything we do is based on merit. Um, our friendships are based on merit. If you're nice to me, then I'll be nice to you. If you're mean to me, then I'm going to cut you out of my life. And I'm not saying that we should necessarily change that. I'm just saying that it's something that we're used to. Our schools are based on merit. If you do well in school, you get an A. If you do poorly in school, you don't get an A, right? Or a B or whatever it might be. I am not saying that we should abolish grades. I'm just saying that our children are used to getting good things through merit. And so are we, because it's how we grew up. Our jobs are based on merit. Not a bad thing, Right? If you do well at your job, then you get more money or more responsibility or whatever. You gain favor with your boss through merit. All that to say is that everything we do in society is merit-based. So when the, God, the Bible comes along and says, your merit, your worth, your value, your earnings can have nothing to do with your salvation, that a person is simply saved without merit... By trusting in the blood of Jesus. And that's what the cross was about, right? 
When Jesus Christ went to the cross, he was literally paying for sins. That's why, remember in the beginning of the Gospels where John uh, the Baptist sees him, he says, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Right? His, his very title is that he's the sin taker. We're not the sin ditchers. We're not the sin worker offers. Right? He's, the one, he's the sin taker. Right? He does it all. Right? We even have the hymn, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. So Paul has laid out, because early on in Christianity, and even to this very day, this idea that a person just gets saved because they trust in the fact that Jesus paid for sin, all sin, in, 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 in 1 John, not just for our sin, but sin of the whole world, he says. That all the world's sin has been paid for, for all time. That, that for you and I to, uh, well, how we say it, to buy into that and to walk to that has always been challenged. In this case, with, uh, to the Galatians and really to the early church, the biggest challenge was adding religion. See, most of us aren't Jews in this room, right? Most of us didn't grow up going to uh, you know, synagogue. We didn't grow up with the uh, Levitical law. We didn't grow up with the, uh, uh, the traditions of Judaism. We didn't grow up with the Talmud. We didn't grow up, you know, we didn't grow up with any of that, right? But in, in the early church, where the church started... Well, it's 3,000 people in Jerusalem that get saved. And why are they in Jerusalem? They're in Jerusalem because they're there for a, a, a spiritual holiday, basically, a Jewish holiday. And so the, the Holy Spirit falls upon the, the people in the room, however many there were, 120 or whatever it is. They go out, they begin to preach the gospel. 3,000 people get saved. Could there have been uh, a couple of Gentiles in that? Maybe. But the vast majority of the, the city is there, well, it's Jerusalem, and the vast majority of the people that had come in extra were for the feast day. So it becomes the church with a lot of, starting with a lot of Judaism. And so what happens is people come out of that um, and they come out of Judaism. And there were some people that came out of it. Uh, in fact, it says in Acts 15 that there's a whole section of the church there in Jerusalem that was of the sect of the Pharisees. So you might recall the Pharisees, they actually started well about 300 years prior to biblical time or the New Testament, where they were began because they just wanted to have, uh, basically protect their children from the Greek influence and the Greek gods and so forth. So they grow up and they become more, uh, or not grow up, but they grow and they become more in the Bible, pictured as kind of a, a hypocritical religious people. Well, they uh, introduce and other people introduce that you need other things to be saved. Namely in Galatians, remember it's, Circumcision, uh, dietary laws, and the Sabbath. Those are kind of the big three that are constantly, uh, in, in, throughout the New Testament, that are kind of hit on as, you, you, Jesus is fine, but you really need these other things also. So Paul and, and the other uh, writers, many of the other writers in the New Testament, again and again and again, are always making the point, no, you don't need those things. So it comes to this place now, in this practical side, where we're saying, okay, how do we, as Christians... People that are not under the law, people that don't have any uh, uh, really attachment to the law, people that aren't made righteous through the law, how do we act? And that's where we picked up, where he says we're to walk by the Spirit. So when we got saved, we received the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, if you think about it, it's, it's the word pneuma, it's just breath, right? Uh, almost every time you see the word Spirit in the New Testament, it's always pneuma, where we got a word like a pneumatic tool, an air-driven tool. Right? So it's pneuma, it's breath. So the idea of the Holy Spirit, he's always referred to as a he, and is a, kind of the, the third part of the Godhead, is, if you will, the essence or the breath of God, the movement of God in a life. He's called the comforter. He's called the advocate. Right? So he's, if you will, he is the, well, he's called the down payment, or the, the, the um, we're sealed, uh, and it's the idea of a signet ring, and he's kind of like the deposit, is one of the English words that's used, from God to us in our salvation. So his role in our life is to encourage, to convict, to strengthen, sometimes physically, uh, mentally, spiritually. And so this is now, as Christians, where we're called to, to walk, listening to, listening for the Spirit. So in this, this kind of conclusion portion of Galatians, the practical application of everything he's been talking about, He's now urging us not to go back to Jewish law, which probably is not a big struggle for us, but we could be tempted to go back to things like, I always read my Bible, so that makes me a good person. 
or I always, uh, uh, I always go to church, so that makes me a good person, or I always do whatever it might be. I always give to ministries, or I always, and, and to point to works as some sort of righteousness or justification for us. And Paul's saying that's, that's not real. That's false. So we're probably not going to go back to Jewish law. I don't know too many of us that are going to be like, you know what? Um, you know, no more pork for me. I'm just going to whatever. Or I'm only going to worship on Saturday. Or I'm only going to whatever it might be. But we might be tempted to look at ourselves, find something we do well, and say, you know what? That's actually what makes me right with God. So in this sense, and real quickly, because this is just by introduction, he's challenging and he's making comparisons. Walking by the Spirit or gratifying the flesh, right? So this word flesh, as is, is we've been talking about um, for a while now, it's, it's the word sarks or sarka, different, different ways it appears. It literally just means dead flesh. You've probably heard the word sarcophagus, right? It's where it's from dead flesh, right? It's what houses dead flesh, you know? Uh, that's all he's saying, the flesh. It's also synonymous or it means the same thing in the Bible with uh, the old man, the sinful nature, the fallen nature, right? These are all ways that the Bible refers to our nature, who we are outside of Christ, without Christ. That essentially we both seminally and spiritually inherited Adam's traits. And in that sense, his nature, his natural trait, right? So we sin. We, it, it comes out of us naturally. So because of that, when we got saved, the Bible says that our old nature wasn't, it wasn't destroyed. It wasn't, it wasn't never to be heard from again, right? You only have to be a Christian for about five minutes to realize that. And so it's not destroyed, but it doesn't have the same power. It doesn't have power anymore. And we'll talk more about that. So he's presenting us with an option. We can either go to, listen to, and adhere to desires of the flesh, or we can listen to, adhere to, and experience fruit of the Spirit. They're two different things, right? Desires are immediate. Acts are immediate. In verse 19, he calls them the acts of the flesh. So it, it, those are immediate things that the flesh is always looking to do, right? But then he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. So these are things that God is wanting to form in us. It's not just the acts of the Spirit. And that's really what I've been uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully half decent at driving home here, is that the fruit of the Spirit are things or one thing, it's singular, that God is doing in your life supernaturally to change you. Christianity is not a behavioral modification program. Super important. Every time we look at Christianity or we look at our walk with God as we're just trying to change behavior, we completely miss what God has for us. And that's where we end up in religion. It's where we end up, end up by saying, well, if you, if you do this and don't do this and do this and don't do this, then you're right with God because that's all we're left with. So this is something where Paul's saying, look, you can respond to this old nature that you have that we know is we don't have to anymore. We have power over it now through the Spirit. He says, or you can allow the Spirit of God to be continually working in your life and you can actually bear fruit. It's that it's... it's that, that idea that you're not producing something, it's allowing something in your life, that you can have that fruit. Uh, and if, if you look at the, uh, the parable of the sower and the seed, when it's talking about the good ground, the heart that allows God's word to, to implant and then to, to bear fruit out of it, it's in, in one gospel it calls it good and honest, and another gospel the heart is called uh, patient, good and patient. So it's this idea that you know, fruit is not made in a day. That's really important. No fruit is made in a day. And I, I, I read a thing a while ago that like a lemon tree takes seven years before it can bear fruit. I'm not advocating for seven years before bearing fruit in your life. I'm just saying that it takes time, right? And it takes elements. And, and as we've been looking at these, these elements revolve around, first and foremost, the first part is love, right? So we know... The Bible tells us that we love God because he loved us. All right? And we're talking about moral love, not just uh, lip service or something like that. But God looked at us and looks at us with a great love and a desire in his heart for our good. He created us. He wants fellowship with us. He's doing that. So here's the thing. The fruit of the Spirit, first and foremost, is formed in us through response. So when we, when we felt and experienced God's love, whether it was, uh, it could happen in different ways. Uh, a spiritual awakening, we heard the gospel, um, the emotional attachment to that, which I'm not saying we should rely on, 
uh, just hearing the truth of what God has for our lives, we somehow heard and experienced God's love. And that caused a reaction in us, right? We didn't say to ourselves, okay, now I will love God back. Watch this, right? We just love him. If you do, you just loved him. You didn't have to muster it. You didn't have to get up in the morning and go, today, loving God, baby, get some, right? You just, you just loved him because you saw who he is, what he's done for you, and it was a kind of a supernatural, natural reciprocation, right? That's how God's love was, was uh, formed in us. So the Spirit is saying, or the Scripture is saying that the Spirit, first and foremost, he bears a fruit in our life, and it's love. And it's through knowing God, it's in, through receiving God and experiencing Him. And we've talked in great detail about that. The next part of that is that it's joy. So when, when you know that someone loves you, what, what is that like? It's joyful. When someone really loves you, really cares about you, when someone's really for you, right? Because that's what love is. Love is not just, oh, someone's emotionally attached to you in some kind of weird way. It's the idea that someone looks at you and wants the best for you. When you know that about someone, you feel like Superman, don't you? You feel like you could do anything. You could, you could leap any wall. No struggle would be too hard, right? And you see that theme repeated in all, so many of our movies and books and all this, right? As, as if being loved makes you bulletproof or something like that. But so there's a direct result from being loved, and it's joy. And to be loved by the creator of the universe, dearly loved, dearly cared about, with no, you know, the Bible says there's no shadow of turning. What that means is, in English, we might say he's not shifty. There's no way he would turn and you'd see darkness. That's what it means. The King James says there's no shadow of turning in him. It means that no matter which way you look at him, he's not shifty. It's all light. There's no dark side to him. And so to, to love that gives joy. And not just happiness, but joy in an, in an, in an eternal sense. Because along with that love, we begin to read the promises. We begin to, to read, as Peter says, we become divine, or excuse me, partakers of his divine nature through the promises, the, the exceeding and precious promises. So we read about what he has for us. We read about what he's done for us. We read about what he wants to work out in our lives. We read that he works all things together for good for those that love him and are called according to his purpose there in Romans chapter 8. We read that he's, he's, he's long-suffering. We read that he has great grace. Right? We read that he has great... So all these things, so we read those things, and they fill us with joy. And then a natural outcome from joy and, and being loved is peace, right? This, this third thing that we have looked at here, peace, tranquility, serenity. That's, that's literally what it means. I know sometimes we can get a little weird about Bible stuff. Like, well, it's a peace. No, it literally means to be at ease, to have tranquility. That we can have peace in our, in our terrible earthly circumstances. Because the Holy Spirit's working. He's wanting to pierce through. And we can know that regardless of what happens to us, regardless of what happens in this world, that God is doing something great. So that's what gives us peace. Peace that surpasses the un, you know, understanding. It doesn't mean that you can't contemplate that, but people will look and they'll see and they'll be like, well, how could you possibly have peace right now? Because I know God. I didn't muster, you can't muster peace, can you? You can't muster joy. Be like, today I'm just going to be joyful. I'm doing it. Today I'm just going to be at peace. I will just have tranquility. No, it's, it's something on the outside that has to act on the inside. And so what we have is the eternal promises and relationship with God. So we have those three things. And they're really a foundation. And if you're like me, I've uh, you know, been reading this for a while now, and just there's always a temptation in this kind of second two-thirds, this, this second, the, the back uh, half of these um, other traits where they, we can begin to look at them external, in an external sense. Because he says in verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I think that there can be a temptation to look at these things like forbearance or kindness and goodness and, 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 and equate them to be merely external actions, right? Like being nice to someone. It's good to be nice to people, right? We can agree with that. The Bible says that we should be kind. But this isn't just an outward action. He's not saying the fruit of the Spirit is that you'll be full of rage on the inside, but you'll manage somehow to not show people that and you'll be able to be kind to them. That wouldn't be a fruit of the Spirit. That would be a fruit of us trying, right? And that's not even a bad fruit, okay? I'm not advocating to say, well, if you don't feel like being nice, then just don't be nice and do whatever you want. Well, we're not saying that. Being nice is good, 
but being kind in your heart is better. Right? Showing patience is good. Truly being patient is even better. Right? But the hard part for most of us, I speak for myself, the hard part for me is when you read something like this, my initial thought is, that's impossible. Could I really be kind on the inside all the time? Could I really be patient and not actually just good at you know, biting my tongue or gritting my teeth? Could I really be these things? And the answer is no. You cannot in yourself. And I cannot either. That's why it is the fruit of the Spirit. Right? It's something that, and this is kind of exciting actually, that God wants to supernaturally change you. Not modify your behavior, not make you nicer to kids and people around you, to modify and to change your heart, to help to usher you into what his call has always been for you, right? Going back to Romans chapter 8, that he has predestined, those whom he foreknew, he did also predestine to be conformed into the image of his son. It doesn't say that he predestined who would get saved. He says, it says that he gave a destiny to those who would believe on him. And the destiny is that every single believer on the planet will eventually be conformed into the image of his son, not just the outside. That would be a terrible promise. That would literally be hell on earth if God somehow converted it so all we did was just be nice on the outside, but we were the same people on the inside. That would be horrific. No, the promise is that this is the fruit that the Spirit is getting in us. And I don't think it's coincidence that it comes on the heel of love, joy, and peace. Because when we are loved and we're you know, experiencing love and reciprocating love to God, when we have joy because of what he's promised us and what he's doing, and when we have peace knowing that nothing can interrupt him in that sense, and I'm always available for him to work in my life and have tranquility over that, when I have those things, guess what my heart's going to be more like? My heart is going to be more inclined to even walk in these fruits, to, to hear what God has, to hear what God wants to do. So it's just important, I, 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 forgive me for the, the, the long introduction here, but the point is that we, it's inescapable that these are miraculous things that God wants to do. It would be the biggest tragedy for us as Christians, one of the biggest tragedies, if we walk out of this room and we think to ourselves, I'm going to try to be nicer. That is not the application. The application is I am going to be open and listen for the Holy Spirit to change me. Amen. And I'm going to move in ways that are going to allow and make me open for that change. That's our application here. So we'll, we'll take a moment and we'll, we'll, we'll look at these and we'll read these uh, to maybe see how they're not just outward things, but they're inward things first. The first one is this, <clears throat> forbearance. It comes from two different words. It's, it's, it's a macrothemia, and it's just the idea. It's kind of interesting. It's the idea of being a long distance from anger. That's what the two words mean, to be a long distance from anger. Now, if I just say patience, again, maybe you're not like me, but if I just say patience or forbearance, that just sounds like an outward action. When someone's annoying me, I will just not show them I'm being annoyed. Right? When my kids have asked me for the 16th time for something I'm not going to give them, I will just pretend like I still love them on the outside. You know, whatever it might be. But I'm not going to... That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about literally being a long way from anger. Another impossibility, isn't it? You cannot control if you experience anger, can you? Because it's just... It's, it's a responsive emotion, right? Something happens and you experience an emotion, and a thought. And I'm not even here to make a commentary on anger, whether it's good or bad or anything like that. Uh, there seems to be a time for anger in life. Um, I'm not here to explore that. I'm here for, to explore the bad side of anger, annoyance, um, pride, right? that kind of stuff that could make us angry. So what's happening here is that Paul is saying that we walk by the Spirit, we're listening to the Spirit, and in the beginning of this fruit production... Right? In the beginning of allowing the Spirit to bear fruit in me, when I recognize anger, I have to respond to the Spirit. Right? That's the beginning of it. It's called repentance. So I see it, and I go, that's not what I want in my life. And hopefully I do that before I say something out loud and, and make things worse, right? which is typically what angry words do. And so I repent, and I say, that's not what I want. And I come back to a place where I say, Lord, that's not what you want either. I want to invite you into my life. Not to be saved. You're already saved. You don't need to get saved again. 
Not to be forgiven. You're already forgiven. But that, that confession of, I want fellowship with you, and I want to walk in the way that you want me to walk, because I know that's life for me, and I know it's relationship with you, and life for my family around me. All right, so that's the for forbearance. Being patient. Long-suffering. That's something that God wants to do in our hearts. It's going to come first by repentance. It's going to come by, I should say, first by knowing him, knowing who he is. Then it's going to come through repentance. And it's going to come through a work of the Spirit. C.S. Lewis puts it this way, uh, talking about the work of the Spirit in our life. He says it's like the lifting of a grounded ship by the tide. That no one can point to a place or a time where it finally started to float, but one day we look back and we realize we're changed. And I think that's a lot of, time, a lot of times how that works out in our hearts. We, we have these desires and we are, we're seeking this change and, and we think, will I ever change? And then one day we look back and we go, wow, I'm not angry anymore. I didn't even have to think about being patient with this person because I just loved them. And then we can acknowledge that I didn't love them because I developed love in my heart. I didn't, I didn't love them because I, I, I'm, a, I'm a good person now. I love them because God's doing something, and I let him do it. And that's our, that's our half of sanctification, us choosing to allow the power of God in our life to make a difference. The power is always there, but the choice is always ours. And so we get to decide if we're going to have forbearance over time because the Spirit is there willing and, and ready to, to, do it, uh, to do a work in that way. The second thing we have here, is kindness. Also, same kind of idea, right? We can think to ourselves, well, if I'm kind on the outside. Being kind on the outside when you're not kind on the inside is pretty rough, isn't it? Emotionally. <laughs> That's called, the fruit of that is bitterness. Right? If we're just always acting kind, but we're not kind, eventually our acting goes by the wayside, doesn't it? Because if we're not actually kind, and really, the, the word kind there, it means goodness or like moral excellence or uprightness. It's the same word that's used when Jesus says the good heart that receives the seed and bears a lot of fruit. It's, it's the idea of quality. It's of excellent quality. Does that make sense? So again, this is, this is not just an external thing. This is something on the inside. To have a heart of excellent quality. Impossible to the sinner. Right? Jeremiah told us that our hearts are deceitfully Wicked, and who could know them? You ever, you ever experienced that before? Where, you, where you, you think to yourself, like legitimately, like sometimes we just make excuses, but when we're actually honest with ourselves and with God, and we do something or we say something, and then, you, and then you look back and you go, I actually have no idea why I did that. In fact, looking back, I knew what destruction that would reap. I knew what saying those words would do. I knew what, whatever, you know, what smoking that would do. I knew what drinking that. I knew what would happen. I don't know. I legitimately don't know why I did it. That's how deceitful our hearts are. That's how, 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 how wicked our, our, our nature and Adam is. And it's, we're just wild. It just, just blows me away. I don't know if you experienced that, where you've done something, you go, I have no idea why I did that. But it was so destructive. So this, this kindness, having a kind heart, these things, this is something that's formed by God. So when I find that there is a lack of quality in my heart, right? So I'm, let's say I'm at home and I'm going to go do the dishes. And I'm going to do the dishes, I, I, you know, whatever. Again, you know, for the, what is 365 days, three meals, you know, that's a lot of dishes every year. Plus snacks and, you know, the kids taking one sip of water and, you know, whatever it might be, right? It can become this thing. Where, so as soon as I recognize that, as soon as I recognize that, I can repent. I don't entertain it. I turn from it. This is that step, right? God's been patient with me. His, his anger is far from me. He's been kind to me. His movements, his promises, his words, his actions, all that, they have been of excellent quality to me. And I need to remember that. And so I can turn from those low-quality thoughts and actions by repentance and turn and invite the Spirit into that moment. Lord, I want to be different. I want to be kind. I can talk myself through who these people are or people that may, I want, may want to be unkind to. 
Maybe it's my children that are, that are driving me crazy, or maybe it's an adult that's driving me crazy, or maybe it's somebody on the road that's driving crazy, or whatever it might be. Just that, that something inside of me is just, and I can say, you know what? I don't know that person. Or my, my, children, my child is doing what comes naturally to them. They're acting like a child. A, a child that, that may or may not know the Lord yet. A child that may or may not be able to control themselves yet. I'm not saying that we, we, we parent by just letting our kids do whatever they want. That is unwise. I am saying that we can take time to work through the emotion, to work through the truth of unkindness, to give that to God. Say, so here you are. I don't want to just be kind on the outside. If you're like me, you settle for that. You settle for it. And that's what the Bible is saying. No, we can't. We can do that, but we can't do that and grow. We cannot settle for merely external change. It's not Christianity, and it's not what God has for us. Being nice on the outside is good, but that's not the end of the gospel. The end of the gospel is being conformed to the image of Christ. And some of that, I'm sure, will happen in this world, and some of it may happen at that 1 Corinthians 3 experience, but when we we pass from from, uh, this life to the next. But the reality is he wants and he is changing us on the inside. That's the end game of Christianity. Next is goodness. <clears throat> Excuse me. So goodness is it's the idea of, the uh, same idea of quality, but it's to do things of quality. The, the, the fruit of our life, that we, we, would just, we would do good things, morally excellent things, quality or excellent quality things. Does that make sense? So again, it's good to choose to do quality things, right? It's good to choose to help someone. Like some, if someone were to ask like the ultimate favor, right, and say, will you help me move, right? Just the pinnacle of friendship favors, right? That's what blood is for. That is not what friends are for. <laughs> but to hear someone say, you know, to text you or whatever, and you're reading the text and you're reading along and all of a sudden you see the word move and you're like, oh, or the phone conversation. Hey, do you still have that truck? Oh, right? So it's, it's the ultimate Nobody wants to help anyone move. And it's so funny because we always ask that. Do you want to help me move? Do you want an answer here? Or do you want me to just tell you I'll be there? Like, which one do you want? Right? But if I'm experiencing love, and I'm understanding the promises of God that I have joy and I have peace, if I'm understanding and I'm walking and being filled with the Spirit and letting the Spirit of God lead into my life, He's trying and he's working and he's forming in me an actual genuine heart that would be able to look at here or whatever this need and excitedly with desire want to do it. I would love to help you move because I realize that's a blessing for you. I realize that you would be blessed by my labor and I can do that for you. Right? Something completely different than showing up and be like, is the pizza here yet? I mean, what? <laughs> Opening the door? Really? Everything's not boxed? You know? <laughs> Carrying this one thing out to the car? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know! We've all been through it. You open the door to the house, you're like, womp, 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 you know? <laughs> <laughs> and if you've done that to people, God forgives you. <laughs> they don't, but God does, you know? I'm just kidding. But to look at that and be like, to be able to open the door and see all the stuff unboxed and go, hey, cool. I'm going to be here for like 12 hours, but God is good. These people need me and I can help them. I'm in. That's a changed heart, right? That's, that's a miraculously changed heart. Because in, in the natural, we open the door and we're like, yeah, why don't you call me in like three hours after you boxed up all your junk? How's that sound? Right? You don't want to do that. A changed heart. Something so much better than, than, than just acting like it. So the next one, he goes from there, is, is uh, uh, faithfulness. Now this is interesting because it's like the word, uh, uh, it means pledge or proof. So it's not, this, it's not just the idea that a fruit of the Spirit is always doing what you said you would do. Although we should do that, right? Jesus said, let our yes be yes and our no be no. And we ought to do the things that we say that we'll do. If we, if we say, yes, I will do this for people, biblically, we should do that. And it is sin if we do not do that. Does that make sense? But that's not necessarily what this means. This literally means, is the idea here is that you are walking by your faith. You're responding to your faith. Does that make sense? 
So it's not just that you always do what you should. It's the idea that you're walking in the trust that you have for God. And you're building that trust. Now, the, 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 the interesting thing about faith or trust is that it cannot be demanded, can it? In fact, if you're in a relationship, any, any relationship, it can be a spouse, it can be a friend, it can be a coworker. If someone says or tries to demand from you trust, it feels very violating, doesn't it? No, you have to trust me, or, or you should trust me, right? Now, there could be some ex- extenuating circumstances where you should, but, but if there's not, to demand trust from someone, it's, it's, I don't know if I'd say it's immoral. I'd have to think about that. But it's an insult, and it's not fair to the person you're doing it to. Because trust is, is, is built, right? You trust God if you do. You trust God because he proved to you that you can be trusted, right? So when you got saved, you heard the gospel. Or however, you know, how, in whatever venue, whether it was on TV or it was through a tract or you read the scriptures or someone preached it to you, whatever it might be, you heard the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of sin. And so you said, you know what? I need that. I am morally bankrupt. I need to be forgiven. And so something happened there. You, you, you started a relationship and you started to trust God, right? Then over time, that trust was built, or, or hopefully was built, right? But how is it built? It was built by finding God faithful, right? So typically, you don't get saved and then go, you know what? I'm going to trust God for this like life-altering injury. You have to go through that, and then you find him faithful, and then you can say, oh, I can trust him in this. Or I can go through this difficulty or this sickness or this whatever it might be, this financial difficulty. Because you begin to go through more and more difficulties in life and you find God to be more and more faithful with his his comfort, his working out for good, his miraculous provision, uh, just all the incredible things that God does in a life through the power of his spirit, right? And then that causes us more and more and more to trust God. Does that make sense? It's like it's how it works in any relationship. You probably, if you're walking with Jesus, trust him more today than you did when you got saved. You probably love him more today than you did when you got saved. I don't know about you, but when I got saved, if someone would say, like, do you love Jesus with all your heart? I'd be like, uh. I mean, I'm glad to be saved. Like, I'm super excited about my sins for, to be forgiven. But I didn't comprehend the cross and what it meant and you know, all the, 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 the promises that he had for me or, or that he wanted to walk with me or he cared about me in some sort of personal way of relationship. Those were things that we learned. So the fruit of the Spirit being, uh, or this portion of the fruit of the Spirit being faithfulness, the idea here is that we walk in the trust that we have, that he, he is developing in us trust and we just walk in that. We choose to because we know him. So that's a fruit in our life. There again, probably for a lot of us, if we were to go back and try to like journal through life and through different circumstances, we could observe over time that in the beginning we might have had real wrestling matches with things. And sometimes they can be things that other people might be like, are you kidding me right now? You wrestle with that? But for us, they were kind of a big deal, Right? But then as we were to, if we were to continue to journal or continue just to think over our lives, you realize like, oh man, that's, that event happened. And I was fully at peace through the whole thing. Or I had a little moment of freak out and then I just noticed God is faithful. And I just walked with him. And you think to yourself, I didn't do anything different. I didn't, I didn't have to muster that up and go, today I'm believing God. I just did. Because we trusted him. Because he's faithful, because he's made promises, because he loves us. So this is fruit being born out of our lives. Sometimes faith is a trial. Sometimes we choose it. And that's good. That's great, right? Battling in our faith to obey God is good. But more and more, God's working out in us that trust and that faith so that we just walk with him. Because when we just walk by faith, all of a sudden, that is peace, right? Come hell or high water. Peace. Right? Or joy, because I know if hell or high water come, that he'll do something good out of it, and I can trust him for it. And love, knowing that he's been faithful to me all this time, and he's not going to change. All right? So this is fruit being worked out in us. Next one is gentleness. This is interesting. Gentleness, or uh, pratis is the, the Greek word, is the idea of humility. 
or meekness. Meekness is the idea of, of power under control. Meekness is not weakness. It's important to note that. When it talks like for about, in, like in ladies, a meek and a gentle spirit, that does not mean that the Bible is calling for ladies to be weak or that they are weak. It means that ladies are called to walk in their strength in a reserved way, and, and men are too. Um, as a side note, the meek and gentle spirit in women, in, in my opinion, is more for men's sake. No, I'm serious. I'm serious. And I'll be glad, you know, we're not going to have a big thing on gender roles today. But you have to, if you're a wife or a girlfriend or a mom, I'm not saying you don't use authority as a mom. Don't, I'm not saying that at all. If you want your husband or boyfriend to respond to you, you have to realize that if you come in like a wrecking ball, one of two things, are most likely, there's two most likely outcomes. If you have a more reserved husband, more of a, a type B personality husband, he's going to retract and he's going to go into his happy place on the couch. And he's going to ignore you. That's where it's going to go. If you have more of a type A personality husband, he's going to match your aggression. And he'll, he'll probably up it. Because that's what type A personalities do. So a lot of times when the Bible says, like, win your husband without a word, or that a meek and gentle spirit is of great value, it's not because the Bible is saying that women are weak. It's saying that if you want to, what's, what do you want do you want to be right and to dominate your husband because you have that option? Or do you want to be happily married? Not to say that men have every excuse in the world. They're called to humble themselves. They're called to love their wives as their own bodies. They're called to lay down their life for their wives. So in that, in that idea of meekness for women, it's not that you're somehow weak and you just need to just you know, cow to your, to your uh, husband. No. Do you want to win your husband? What do we mean by win? Do you want to establish a relationship, a dialogue, a partnership? We're called, you're called to do it without a word because we have big heads. It's just, it just sucks. This is true. To approach your husband, the way to do it typically for most men is not direct. It's to love them. Let them know you respect them. They'll do anything for you if you do that. Now for men... We're called to, to cherish our wives and lay down our lives for them. And so it's going to be really hard for a woman to show respect to a man who doesn't cherish her. And so for us, as men, if we want to see, what do we want? Do we want to win our wives? Do we want a, a relationship? Or do we just want to do what we want to do with benefits? But if you want to develop a relationship, it's going to come through that loving leadership, listening, humbling yourself. So there's two sides of it. You see what I'm saying? Each side has weakness. Men have weakness and women have weaknesses. And But each side, God's instruction to each gender, each side of the genders, is to overcome those weaknesses. Does that make sense? So we have that opportunity. Anyway, I don't know why I'm going on about that. So we'll just pretend the Holy Spirit did that, and then I'll just go on with our text. How's that sound? <laughs> I feel it now. That was a word of wisdom. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> anyway, so in this, this second idea of, of gentleness is humility, right? So humility is not to debase yourself. It's not to insult yourself or to mock yourself or to put yourself down. In other words, humility is not like, I'm stupid, I'm no good at anything, because those are lies, right? The chances of you actually being stupid in the real meaning is very, very, very minimal. And the chances of you being good for nothing is zero, Right? Because God has given you gifts. He's given you uh, a life. right? He's given you a soul to be changed. And, and it doesn't matter if you're smart or not smart or if you're fit or not fit. That's not what's at play here. What's at play is are you listening to Jesus and then walking in what he's gifted you? And you go, I don't know what he's gifted me in. Then just walk in kindness. If you want to be an incredible witness, right? If you, if you want to be, you don't have to be able to like, number the years of the age of the earth. You don't to be an incredible witness for Jesus. You don't have to understand how geology works. You don't have to understand how space works. You don't have to understand how the zodiac works. You don't have to know any of that to be a witness for Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, this is how everybody will know you're my disciples, if you love each other, John 13, 35. He didn't say, if you're an expert in all things theology, if you're an expert in all things age of the earth, 
If you're an expert, no, those things can be fascinating. I'm not saying don't study those. I'm not saying there's no place for apologetics. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying if you want people to know you're a disciple of Jesus, it's going to be love. So in this idea of, of, of humility, we're not just walking around putting ourselves down. The idea is we don't consider ourselves. In other words, I don't come into the equation when I'm thinking about things. In the sense of like, if someone, if someone says to me, you're the worst pastor I've ever met. I'd be like, okay, well, I'm working on it. I mean, I don't have to get mad, right? It's pro- I'm probably not the worst. You know, I feel like you know, David Koresh might be a notch below me or something like that, but you know, <laughs> you know. I'm definitely not the best, right? But I don't, have, I, don't have to, I don't even have to take it personally. I can just say, like, well, I do want to improve in that area. If someone comes to me and says, you're the best pastor ever, I go, <laughs> yeah, okay, whatever. <laughs> right? You know, it's, I don't have to consider myself. It's not, I don't have to take it and go, oh. You know. So if someone treats me poorly, it's okay. If someone treats me like a king, it's okay. Because it's not about me. It's not about you. Right? So that's the idea of humility is I'm not esteeming myself. I'm allowing God to be my esteem for myself. I'm allowing, he's my protector. He protects my heart. Now, I'm not saying we just go around and try to put ourselves in abusive situations. But as Christians, you will be in places of abusive situations. And not, I'm not talking about weird stuff. I'm just saying people will treat you badly. Other Christians will treat you badly. Sometimes maliciously, sometimes just because we're crazy. But we'll do it, Right? And so it's, it's part of the fruit of the Spirit is I don't have to take those things personally. I don't have to be offended. Offense sells in our society. It's the biggest seller in our society. It's the biggest seller in politics. It's the biggest seller in social media. It is, it is, it's, what, it's our currency of exchange. How offended I am about something you've done or said, and now I need to tell other people, and then they can be offended too. And let's just have a big offended party. And we can just have a, our identity can be about what offends me. That's a miserable identity. It feels energizing because it's energized by the flesh. It's energized by anger. It's energized by emotion. But in the end, it's death and isolation and deflated, being deflated. So we have to reject that kind of idea and that kind of societal move in our lives and instead come back to this place where you matter, right? God said you were worth the blood of his son. God said that it, or I should say Isaiah said through prophecy, it pleased God, the Father, to crush his son for you. Not that God is a sadist, but that he looked at this crucifixion, he looked at the judgment upon Jesus for our sin, that he, that the Father did, he did it. He judged Jesus. And it pleased him to do it because he saw the effect that you and I could be reunited. So it's with with those realities in mind that we come back to and we say, like, I don't have to be offended. And this is something that the the Spirit's wanting to get in me, that I don't have to always be considering myself. And so in that sense, when when I find myself considering myself, and it can be in all sorts of different ways, right? It can be, uh, you know, my latte's cold, and it makes me really mad because I paid, like, $5 for it. I guess probably, like, you know, $20 now. But, you know, I I paid this... I, I went out and bought this latte. And maybe it's the one latte I buy a month because that's what I can budget. And I go and I get this latte and it's like, behold, the latte. It's like the golden calf of lattes, right? It's like, and it like floats down to you. And then you sip and you're like, it's cold. <laughs> and you like look at the barista and you're like, you did this. <laughs> you know? This was your doing. Who would do such a thing? And we can get all rallied in our mind and offended. When in reality, you just be like, oh, this is disappointing. We can be honest about it. And then you have two options. You can exercise kindness and be like, could I have a new one? This one's cold. Or you could just be okay with having a cold latte. I mean, that's pretty radical Christianity. But I'm just saying that, (laughs) you know, whoo. That probably just ended it, right? That's like... (laughs) That's a bridge too far, my man. You know, but, but you know what I'm saying? Like we, I could suffer loss, and actual good could come of that. It's, it's a, it's, I could realize I don't need this stuff. Like Every opportunity actually has pretty significant spiritual ramifications in my life. And it comes down to how I respond to the promptings of the Spirit in the situation, or just pre-based knowledge and wisdom that's already given to me from the Scriptures. Does that make sense? We don't, you know, I'm going to be careful here. But we, we always need the Holy Spirit, right? 
But we don't always need the Holy Spirit to talk to us, do we? There's some things we just know, <laughs> right? Being okay with a cold latte, I don't need a move of the Spirit. I don't need a dove to fly out of the bush to tell me that, right? <laughs> I can just know that I can go without. I don't have to pray about it. I don't have to wonder. I can just know because God's told me that everything's going to be okay with my once-a-month cold latte. It's going to be all right. And, 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 and he'll work it out for my good. The last one there is uh, self-control. This is also kind of a, it's, a, it's two words. It's en kratos or uh, en uh, kartia. And it just means, it's, interesting, it's an interesting word. It means to be literally in power. That would be like a direct translation. But that doesn't really work uh, for English. So it's more the idea of that I have mastery over my power, over myself. Does that make sense? So this is an internal thing first, right? Because he's not talking about, we can read self-control and we can equate that to, I shouldn't yell at people. I shouldn't treat people poorly. That's, yes, but that's not what's being said here. What's being said here is that on the inside, internally, I have self-control. Now, if, that, if, if I have to have power over something, what is it that is saying I have to control? Right? Because it's self-control. It's something in me that I have to control. But yet I have help. And what, it's my nature, my old nature. Right? Because since my old nature is cropping up, I have a responsibility to reject it. Now, we, we won't turn there for time's sake, but we have Romans 6 and a lot of these other verses that show us that when we received Christ in God's eyes, he reckoned it or he tallied it up to mean that we were crucified with Christ. Okay, this is what Romans 6 says. So when God looks at the individual who's trusted him for the forgiveness of sins, he looks at that, identi- at that person as identified with Jesus' death. In other words, he, he judged his son, and in a sense, well, not in a sense, is what the scriptures say, that we were in that judgment, that he took that judgment for us. And so by faith, we are now baptized, the Bible says, not water, just immersion, into his death. So, so we are as equated as having the debt paid, and, and, and we're dead, according to sin. Then it says, because we died with Christ, and because Christ rose from the dead, just like we were united, is what it says there, united with him in his death, God equates us as united with him in his life. Okay. So when, when the Father looks at us, he sees us in Christ forgiven. Sin paid for eternal life having. Does that make sense? So in this last idea here of self-mastery, I still have this old nature, right? I still have this drive in me that if we were kind of just defining it as just selfish, self-preeminence, right? Making sure number one is taken care of, that I'm the most protected, I'm the most provided for, I'm the most, you know, I get the best emotions, I get all these things, right? I'm going to make sure. That's the flesh, So what I'm called to have control over, and this is internal, is to reject the urges, to reject the desires, different words the Bible uses, of that old nature. Now what we'll find is that the the old nature will never be quiet. Right? We all respond to screaming, don't we? Have you ever been in a a, a supermarket before and either your own kid or you're watching some poor soul out there with a kid who just starts screaming, right? And what do we do or what do the parents do when that happens? Typically, they panic. You can, like, see it in their eyes because there's there's shame in that. I'm not not saying there should be, but but you feel it, right? I'm a terrible person. I'm a terrible mom. I'm a terrible dad. And so you're just like, it's like anything to get the kid to be quiet. Like, (laughs) You, before, you're like, no, we're not getting that. No, no Snickers. No this. No, not that. And then all of a sudden, they're like, Wah! And we're like, the whole bar. You know? <laughs> we respond to screaming. If you're, in a, if you're in a location and someone screams, if you're in a restaurant and you hear a scream, everybody in the restaurant goes, <laughs> right? What was that? Is someone dying or was their latte cold? What happened here, right? <laughs> That's what the sinful nature does, and it's what it will do. It screams. And it's looking for a response. It's interesting. When you read through Romans, it's, Paul almost, like kind of, uh, almost gives it a, a, a character of its own. 
And it almost, almost humanizes it a little bit, like, a, like a, a, an actual person, when he talks about how the, the, the old nature works. But we don't have to listen to it. It can scream all at once. It's screaming because it's dying. It's screaming because it's got no power anymore. And so when we find that in our lives, when, that, when we hear that old nature, part of the fruit that God is getting in us, that more and more we can identify it and reject it. And that's supernatural, right? Because before we have the Holy Spirit, we just did what the flesh wanted. And even if, even if we had to do something we didn't want to do, we did it so that we could achieve a, a bigger fleshly goal, right? I might want to kill someone, but I might not do that because prison's worse than that, right? So there's, there's, there's things that I will do that I don't want to do in my flesh in order to avoid something that my flesh doesn't want even more. Does that make sense? But now in the Spirit, God's changing me and working me, so it's not just me not doing things because I, I fear the repercussions or something like that. It's me observing and understanding the death that lies in that old nature and, and kind of in that supernatural, natural way, observing it, recognizing it, and rejecting it. And so that's part of the fruit that God's giving. We'll end here because he has a couple of promises, and we'll just read these for time's sake. Uh, make a couple comments. It says in verse 24, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Now this is important. I want to point this out. Who are those who have crucified? Who, first of all, who belongs to Jesus? Believers. Right? Can we agree on that? Believers belong to Jesus. Amen. All right? After that, there, so this is a statement of fact. Past tense Fact. And the past tense fact about those who belong to Jesus is that those, the old nature is crucified. Romans 6 says it's been rendered inoperative in power. Its power has no more, it doesn't have power over us. Or I should say it says so that it would be rendered inoperative. So the point that Paul is making here, because it, it, we can get weird and sometimes people will, I think with a, with a good motive, will, will make it out and they'll say, well, the people that belong to Jesus are the people that are walking with Jesus. And it's a subtle switch, but it's an important switch. You belong to Jesus as someone who's put their faith in Jesus, whether you're walking with Jesus or not. If you take that away, then you have to, we have to ask ourselves and quantify, every time we sin, I am not walking with Jesus. Does that make sense? So if, if, my, if my crucifixion of the flesh, if my standing in Christ is dependent on me, Will any of, us, any of us stand in Christ? No. Right? So the idea here isn't when you're walking with Jesus and everything's peachy, then you've crucified the flesh. The fact of the matter is, when you received Christ, you were crucified with him, you rose from the dead uh, in him, you have spiritual life, and so you are that person who, by the power of the Spirit, has had the Spirit, or excuse me, has had the flesh crucified in you. All right? Put to death. Rendered inoperative. Why is that important? Because he's giving them, this is not a challenge to them, this is an encouragement. Remember, the whole thing here is a, is a, is a comparison. This is how the flesh acts. This is how the spirit acts. As someone who's not under the law, we want to walk by the spirit. We don't want to listen to the flesh and, and obey its, its cries. Right? So there's a comparison here. So this isn't this, an extra challenge like, you better crucify. No, this is the idea that, look, this is what the Spirit is doing in you, and you've already, in Christ, your old nature is crucified. It's already happened. So you have the power, and, and really, it's both power and obligation, power, right, and obligation to walk in that. And if you want to experience God in these ways, if you want this fruit in your life, because let's just be honest, is it, is it better to be, hold on to our flesh and be angry and pretend we're being nice? That's miserable. That is miserable. Or is it better to just actually be like Jesus? Like, like for real, for real, no cap on the inside. <laughs> be like Jesus. Yeah. I think that's what we want, right? We want to be changed. We want to walk in our destiny now. And more and more, that's what he's, what he's calling us to do. Then after that, he says, look, and here's the challenge. Here's the, 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 what it boils down to for us this morning. Since we live by the Spirit. Who lives by the Spirit? We do. We have life because of God's Spirit who's attached himself to us unconditionally, right? 
All things are made new. 2 Corinthians 5, right? That all things are made new. The old things have passed away. That we've been sealed by the Spirit of God um, according to his foreknowledge. I mean, just all sorts of crazy, awesome stuff, right? If you live by the Spirit, meaning you've been born of the Spirit, meaning you're a saved individual, then there's a challenge to you as a saved individual. And the challenge is the second half. Let us keep in step with the Spirit. So whenever you're walking with someone, have you ever walked with someone that, that, that duck walks? In other words, like, you're walking down the road, and like somehow miraculously, they just kind of move to the side. And like pretty soon, you're like in the bushes. That happens on our family walks all the time. I won't say who does it. But it's, <laughs> it happens all the time on our family walks. So it used to. It's, it's, it's been good these last few years. But in the, in the past, there was some serious like nudging one way or the other. Right? That's not walking in step, is it? When you're walking in step, and it doesn't really matter if you're talking about like running in, 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 in a formation like in the military, or if you're just walking with your family or just with another person. If you're going to keep in step with them, every once in a while at least, you have to look and see if they're next to you, right? If you're walking along and suddenly their voice is getting more and more and more distant behind you, you have to stop for a second and go, oh, what's happened here? Did I speed up? Did they slow down? I need to remedy that. Right? If you're running with a bunch of people in your platoon in the military and you just decide you're not going to watch your step anymore, guess what happens? You wipe out a whole bunch of dudes and then everybody gets yelled at. It's just a bad deal, 100%. Right? So I like the way that the, 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 it's phrased here, keep in step with the Spirit. Not just like walk with the Spirit. That's cool. It's good. It's in the Bible. Watch his steps. That's, that's very um, purposeful, isn't it? It's Because walking... And I'm not, obviously, I'm not correcting the Bible here, right? But walking is kind of generic. Like, yeah, I'm walking, I'm walking with God. But if I'm going to look at the Spirit's steps, that means I have to concentrate. I have to look down. Like, okay, is he stepping now? Is he moving forward? Did he slow down? Did I speed up? What does God have for me? Because if I want to bear his fruit, I can't walk away from him. I can't leave the Spirit behind, shut him out of my life, and just keep on strolling and be like, this is so weird. I'm not experiencing his fruit. I don't know why. But that's what we do, isn't it? We reject all these opportunities to be with God, to understand God. And I'm not speaking to your life directly. I'm saying in general we can do this. And, and, then we, and then we want to blame God afterwards when we're not experiencing the fruit. When the reality is the fruit is always there. The Holy Spirit is always offering growth to us. He is always offering us a, a walk with him. He's always making his steps uh, evident to us. right? So Paul says, look, if you live by the Spirit, here's this new life. And it's to walk by the Spirit. And then, and then this is, to me, this is so weird. Verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. You're like, we were on a really good roll there. Why, <laughs> Why do you conclude this thought with don't do these things? And this is my thought. If we look at Christianity as a religion of abstinence, meaning we just don't do this, we don't do this, and we make sure we do this, that creates a dynamic emptiness and legalism that's what that creates and when we become when we just do things because we have to or we do things and we're successful at them what is that and other people are not what does that usually spawn in us compassion not usually conceit right if i look to my works if i go i read all the spiritual books and you know what i have everything dr jeremiah written memorized along with the bible and I have a five-hour devotion, and uh, I don't even buy $15 lattes because that would be unfaithful with my finances. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if we do that, and it's all because it just works. It's just self-control. We look at other people that don't do our great works, and we despise them. And we'll say, like, well, if you were hard, more harder working like me, then you would know what God is really like. Oh, if you did this like me. And that's what the Pharisees did, right? If you were like us, Jesus isn't like us. We hate that guy. You should be like us instead. Right, so that's what that creates. So I think Paul is just giving a warning. He's like, look, you have everything you need to walk with God. He wants to do this great work in your life. And it's right there at your fingertips. But then he's, there's this warning. We don't want to become conceited. We don't want to provoke each other. The law, we provoke each other with our religious laws. We, we really can. When someone doesn't have the same conviction we do, and we go, oh, really? Hmm. Interesting. Right? We provoke them. And Paul says, we don't want religion. We don't want fakeness. 
Be nice is a good start. Repentance is good. But the Spirit's looking to develop fruit in our life. And it's going to come from more and more opening ourselves, listening to, and walking in how the Spirit leads us. And that's the only way it can happen, is just uh, Him infusing us with His power as, as He offers it to us. So God has great things for you guys. Do not grow weary in well-doing. The Lord has great blessing for you. So when we pray, and we'll sing a song, and we'll be on our way. Father, thank you for your great kindness and your great mercy and your great promises. Lord, we want, we, we want to be like you. We're, we're tired of being like ourselves. And uh, we just want to invite you into our lives. And Lord, if there's places where we've ignored you for years, we pray that you would open our eyes to that again through mercy. Lord, we pray you get a, a willingness in our hearts to listen um, every opportunity. And Lord, thank you for being so patient with us, so kind to us uh, until this very moment and that we can expect that same treatment for our lives. Lord, we pray for your presence with us this week. We pray for real fruit this week and that you would be exalted in our, in our hearts, our homes, and uh, places of work and your spirit would go with us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.